welcome to Global Optimum, the podcast dedicated to making you a more effective altruist. I am Daniel Gambacorda. We're going to start off today with a groaner. Why did the Center for Effective Altruism need a new door? Their old door wasn't hingy enough. This episode will feature two segments, Apply Psychology, in which I will discuss techniques for learning more effectively, and Check This Rec, in which I'll provide you with a recommendation of a book, article, podcast that perhaps you are not familiar with. Let's get into it. As your body grows bigger, your mind grows flowered, it's great to learn because knowledge is power. So goes the intro song of Schoolhouse Rock, an educational cartoon that I grew up watching. The notion that learning is good and that knowledge is power is not new or contrarian or interesting. We've all been lectured on the importance of education, Learning is supposed to make us good citizens, and we're supposed to respect people who know a lot. All that having been said, I still think that learning is underrated. Continually learning throughout your life, optimizing your learning, and making learning a top priority are all super important and undervalued. In this segment, I'm going to first talk about the importance of learning a lot and continually learning more. Then I'll go over various tips and hacks related to learning. And finally, I'll discuss the psychological research on how to learn most effectively. I'll start by quoting The Twelve Virtues of Rationality by Eliezer Yudkowsky. In this article, Yudkowsky discusses the virtues you should cultivate if you want to get really good at having true beliefs. Quote, the eleventh virtue is scholarship. Study many sciences and absorb their power as your own. Each field that you consume makes you larger. If you swallow enough sciences, the gaps between them will diminish and your knowledge will become a unified whole. If you are gluttonous, you will become vaster than mountains. End quote. When you learn a lot, you get better at Evaluating ideas, which helps you have more accurate beliefs, which helps you get better at evaluating ideas, and so on. The mathematician Richard Hamming said that knowledge and productivity are like compound interest, which is perhaps true if you are a mathematician. The rationalist version replaces productivity with rationality. As you learn, you can become more rational which helps you learn. Plausibly, a small difference in the rate at which you learn can have a big long-run impact on the accuracy of your beliefs and your ability to achieve your goals. To get a bit more specific, when you learn a lot, you develop expertise or a more general epistemic taste that lets you better evaluate ideas you come across in the future. As a product of all the facts and models that hang together in your web of belief, you develop intuitions for sensing when something isn't quite right. The truth has a certain ring to it. It has a particular flavor that you can get better at discriminating. For example, as I was doing research for this episode, I came across studies that purport to show that if you study material in several different locations, you will remember that material better compared to if you only study in one location. In one study, for example, it was found that students who received statistics lectures in several different locations outperformed students who received the same lectures all in the same location. The given explanation for this finding is... We incidentally encode environmental cues when learning material, and if we learn that material in various different contexts, 
we have more cues to draw on in memory. So if you study in different locations, the studied material will be associated with a wider variety of cues, which will help you remember the material. When I came across these findings, I thought they tasted bad. This is not a good epistemic taste. This tastes like bad psychology. I found out that these effects have been replicated and that there's a meta-analysis which is consistent with these effects existing. I still felt like shenanigans were afoot. I googled study in different locations and I found the first three articles, including a New York Times article, all recommend studying in different locations based on this research. None of the other articles Google turned up were relevant. All of this evidence, of course, had me curious, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was awry. As I dug deeper, I found that there were various failures to replicate effects related to the basic idea of context-dependent memory. I found that the underlying theory is on shaky ground. I found more recent research that reaches the opposite conclusion of the original research, that you actually remember less if you study in different locations. Basically, there's just not that much research, and it's kind of a mess. And given the priors we should have about psychological science, that means I should not recommend this as a learning technique to my podcast listeners. If I was a normal person who hadn't spent thousands of hours studying psychology, I probably would have believed the first study I came across and gleefully recommended that people schlep around to different places whenever they study. Indeed, all the popular articles I could find on this topic do just that. But because I've developed a degree of epistemic taste, I could apply it in an edge case and thereby not mislead people who might actually follow my recommendations. So it's important to learn lots constantly and forever in order to develop that epistemic taste you need to arrive at accurate beliefs. Learning lots is also important because there are a number of crucial considerations out there that, once understood, radically alter our priorities. There are ideas that can transform you, ideas that change what you care about, ideas that make you realize that what you've been doing the past 10 years has been a mistake. Some of these are unknown unknowns. You don't know what you're missing, and you won't know until you find them. Most troubling is the fact that many of the ideas that effective altruists consider most crucial are really rather recent developments. Probability theory, modern utilitarianism, existential risk, long-termism, these ideas are really quite recent, which should make us think that there's probably lots of other crucial considerations we're missing. We are probably very wrong about lots of things, the same way people a hundred years ago were very wrong about lots of things. We are missing out on huge insights that would radically change what we value, and as best as I can tell, the only thing we can do is keep searching. We have to just learn and search and learn and search. If you could get better at learning and searching, that could be a big deal. Next up, I'm going to go over some tips and hacks for learning better. I shall number these for the sake of structure. Number one, you could think about how you can squeeze more learning into your day. I'm always listening to podcasts and audiobooks when I'm driving, working out, getting ready, eating. What I do personally is I watch or listen to scholarly stuff during the hours I work, and I will watch or listen to entertainment stuff when I'm off of work. 
I schedule time to read every workday. I read aside from that, but it's been useful for me to have a scheduled chunk of time dedicated to reading. I barely use social media, but to the extent I do, it's optimized for learning. On Facebook, I unfollow everybody who doesn't post about science or ideas. I don't have a Twitter account, but I'll visit the accounts of people who tweet scholarly stuff. You can think about how you can optimize your information diet. It's worth spending a few minutes thinking about. Number two, there's lots of great resources for learning. And today it's much easier than in the past to learn about whatever topic you want to learn about. If you want to start out learning some field or established topic, your best bet is textbooks. That is the whole point of a textbook, to provide a relatively consensus view of what is pretty well nailed down in a field. If you want textbook recommendations, there is a less wrong thread I have linked to in the show notes that lists the best textbooks across many different subjects. If you are going in depth on some particular topic, try to find a review article on that topic. Sometimes scholars publish journal articles or book chapters reviewing all the major research on some topic. Starting with a review article will be way more efficient than plotting through the literature yourself. If you can't access a paper because it's behind a paywall, then you may be able to find it at a hub of science. A science hub, if you will. I'm not saying there's a website called SciHub that will give you access to any paywalled article you want. I'm not saying that. If a website like that did exist, it wouldn't necessarily be legal in the U.S. But if it did exist, I would use it because some laws are bad. These days, there's tons of great video and audio content available for free or at low cost. Lots of universities put videos of lectures online. Also, if you live near a university, you can probably sit in on any class you want if you are so inclined. Just ask the professor. They will probably be flattered. I'd recommend getting an account with Audible. Audible is an audiobook service. The vast majority of book reading I do is through audiobooks. If you have an Audible account, I'd recommend checking out The Great Courses. The Great Courses are a collection of university-level classes taught by recognized scholars. If you buy a video class through their website, it can be hundreds of dollars. But if you buy an audio class through Audible, it costs as much as any other audiobook. Number three, speed up your learning. Literally. If you don't already, try listening to podcasts and audiobooks sped up. Most podcast apps have a function where you can speed up playback, likewise for video. I think speeding up a podcast or video can actually make it easier to pay attention to, especially if it's not too information dense. Also consider that even if speeding up playback causes you to retain a bit less information, this can be outweighed by how much more information you expose yourself to. If I'm listening to audiobooks at 2x speed, even if I'm retaining less than I normally would, this can be more than made up for by the fact that I'm reading twice as many books. I wouldn't push this too far. Of course, there's value in having a deep rather than surface understanding of things. And when something is information dense, I'll listen at normal speed. But if you aren't listening to my voice sped up right now, give it a shot. Then if you ever meet me in person, you can feel shocked at how slowly I speak. Number four. Remember Cowan's second law. 
There is a literature on everything. You'd be surprised the extent to which everything under the sun has been studied and written about. There's research on how reminding people of their death affects their ability to play basketball. There are at least 56 experiments on rat tickling. There's research on whether people prefer to eat chocolate bunnies starting with the ears or the feet. By the way, if you start with the feet, you are a weirdo. Number five, hire online tutors. This isn't something I've done myself, but it seems like a good idea. I'm going to read a public Facebook post written by Buck Schlegeris, who is a researcher at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. In this post, Buck goes over the advantages of hiring an online tutor on Wizant, which is an online platform for finding tutors. Quote, I think that an extremely effective way to get a better feel for a new subject is to pay an online tutor to answer your questions about it for an hour. It turns out that there are a bunch of grad students on Wizant who mostly work tutoring high school math or whatever, but who are very happy to spend an hour answering your weird questions. For example, a few weeks ago, I had a session with a first-year Harvard Synthetic Biology PhD. Before the session, I spent a 10-minute timer writing down things that I currently didn't get about biology. We spent the time talking about some mix of the questions I'd prepared, various tangents that came up during those explanations, and his sense of the field overall. I came away with a whole bunch of my minor misconceptions fixed, a few pointers to topics I wanted to learn more about, and a way better sense of what the field feels like and what the important problems and recent developments are. There are a few reasons that having a paid tutor is a way better way of learning about a field than trying to meet people who happen to be in that field. I really like it that I'm paying them, and so I can aggressively direct the conversation to wherever my curiosity is, whether it's about their work or some minor point or whatever. I don't need to worry about them getting bored with me, so I can just keep asking questions until I get something. End quote. Number six, follow people rather than genre. This is a very general principle. In the arts, There might be a style of music you like, or a genre of story you like, and to get more art you like, you might try to search based on style or genre. In general, I think it's better to find artists you really like and check out other things they are doing, even if it isn't in the genre you prefer. I like progressive rock. And I can find music by searching for progressive rock, but I could do even better if I think about which musicians I like best and see what other projects they are involved in, even if those projects aren't progressive rock. When it comes to collecting insights, insights that are hard to come by, you could search based on the fields or topics you are interested in. You can read through relevant books and articles, I think the better strategy is to pick out the people who you think are most insightful and just check out their other work that you aren't familiar with, even if that other work isn't on a topic you are most interested in. The best people tend to do the best work, period. The person matters more than the genre. Number seven, cultivate viewpoint diversity. We tend to selectively expose ourselves to information we think we'll agree with and avoid information we think we'll disagree with. Likewise, we tend to be much more critical when we come across information we disagree with. We try to find some way to justify not believing it. I discussed this 
confirmation bias in a previous episode of the podcast titled Modularity Insights for Charisma and Creativity. So what do we do about this? One answer is to go out of your way to expose yourself to ideas you expect to disagree with. I think this can be a good practice that at least a fraction of what we expose ourselves to should be ideas we expect to disagree with. However, I think there's a good way of doing this and a bad way of doing this. The bad way of doing this is searching for disagreeable ideas based on genre. Say you are liberal and you want to expose yourself to the genre of conservatism. You find that Fox News and Breitbart are the two most popular conservative news outlets, so you go to those to get your dose of conservative thought. This seems to me like clearly a bad idea. To the extent that you try to find ideas you disagree with, you should look for the strongest version of those ideas. However, that might be hard to find if you aren't already an expert in the area and you probably won't be particularly motivated to find the strongest version of an idea you dislike. I think a better general practice is to find people you think are smart and who you agree with on some things, but you disagree with on much else. Notice here that I am recommending you search by person rather than topic. I refer to smart people I disagree with as voices worth listening to. These are people who I respect and share many assumptions with, but who I have substantial disagreements with. It'll be a lot easier to get yourself to engage with ideas from a voice worth listening to than some random proponent of an idea you don't like. If you're going to put extra effort into cultivating viewpoint diversity, put that effort into finding voices worth listening to and exploring their ideas. I think as a general practice, the payoffs for that are better than trying to force yourself to study ideas you disagree with. Number eight, be only moderately completionist. Some people feel like if they start something, they have to finish it. If they start a TV show, they have to finish the season. If they start a book, they have to finish it. There is an enjoyment that comes with finishing a thing. I think in the context of learning, this completionist tendency can be beneficial. Some parts of learning may be a slog, and it's the completionism that helps push you through it. That said, in this modern world where we have access to all of the knowledge of humanity cheaply and instantly, completionism can be a really bad habit. There are so many good books and podcasts and blogs, you can't waste time finishing the bad ones. If you aren't getting anything out of some resource, it's important to be able to let it go. I'd say I finish two-thirds of the books that I start reading, though I also take a good number of chances. I'll start books I expect not to love. Anyway, the moral is that in this modern age, we have to be able to give up on things that aren't great because there's a lot of great stuff out there. But don't give up on the podcast you're listening to right now. That, of course, would be deeply unwise. Number nine, don't get parasitized by bad ideas. If you are constantly exposing yourself to lots of ideas, then won't you eventually get seduced by a bad idea? And that bad idea will lead you to believe in other bad ideas. And eventually, you'll be yelling in the streets about how the earth is flat and vaccines cause autism and 9-11 was an inside job. This is a silly example, of course, but it is true that plenty of people learn stuff that makes them dumber, and then they go down a dumb rabbit hole that makes them even dumber. So how do you avoid getting infected with bad ideas? First, 
study rationality. The go-to resource for this would be The Less Wrong Sequences, which were later turned into the book titled Rationality from AI to Zombies by Eliezer Yudkowsky. If you can become more rational, you'll be better at distinguishing good ideas from bad. Second, develop some kind of technical background, ideally before you get too deep into the airy-fairy stuff. Study something that has firm rules, something STEMI. Don't start with philosophy or literary theory. If you dive into the humanities without sufficient rationality, you are fairly doomed. That's it for my tips and hacks. Next, I'll go over what psychological science has to say regarding how to learn most effectively. There are a number of widely believed myths about learning, there are popular studying techniques that are ineffective, and there are legit methods for enhancing memory that are rarely utilized. I'll go into what works and what doesn't. As in the previous section, I will number the points I'm making for the sake of structure. Number one, learning styles. One popular idea is that each of us has a particular learning style. Some of us are visual learners, some of us are auditory learners, some of us are verbal learners, and so on. And if you learn according to your particular learning style, you will learn better. The only problem with the idea of learning styles is there's no evidence that you learn better when taught in accordance with your learning style. It's one of those ideas that went viral even though the science never backed it up. And the theoretical basis isn't solid either. There are more than 70 learning style theories, and naturally they contradict each other, so it's just kind of a mess. Now, of course, people have learning preferences. Some people would prefer to read a book, some would prefer to watch a lecture, but there's no evidence that if you are taught according to your preference, you retain the material better. It just doesn't seem like there's anything useful here. Number two, highlighting. When studying a text, it's very common for students to highlight what they consider to be the important parts, or at least the parts they think will be on the test. The effectiveness of highlighting has been studied a fair bit. Here's an example of a typical experiment. Undergraduate students were assigned to read articles. There were three conditions. One group of students just read the articles. A second group read the articles and were instructed to highlight the important material. And a third group read marked articles that had been highlighted by yoked participants in the second group. So, one group just read the material, one group highlighted, and one group read articles that had already been highlighted. All groups were able to study the articles for an hour. A week later, the students came back to the lab. They were given 10 minutes to review their materials. Then they took a test on the articles. The study found that all groups performed about the same on the test. This is a typical sort of finding. Most studies on highlighting show no benefit. It's possible that highlighting does increase retention of highlighted material, but decreases retention for unhighlighted material. And given most students' ability to identify the most important information, these two effects basically cancel each other out. It's also possible that highlighting draws more attention to individual concepts than to connections across concepts. In one study, two groups of students studied a text, one group was instructed to underline the important parts, and the other group just read the text. On subsequent test questions that targeted individual facts found in the text, both groups performed similarly. However, on test questions that required making inferences 
based on information found throughout the text, the group that underlined did worse. So there's at least some evidence for highlighting being detrimental. The best case scenario for highlighting is if a student is really good at it, they are better than average at identifying which parts of a text are important, and they will be tested on facts rather than having to make inferences or draw connections. In that case, perhaps it's beneficial. But overall, unless highlighting is giving you some motivational benefit, I would say save money on markers, give up on highlighting. Number three, rereading versus testing. Rereading is a common study technique among students, and the evidence generally shows that it's better than nothing. If you read a thing again, you remember it better compared to not reading it again. However, the memory benefits of rereading are dwarfed by testing. Testing yourself on material works much better than just reading the material over again. It is a waste of time to reread if you can test yourself on what is important. Testing includes things like using flashcards, completing practice problems, and taking practice tests. Retention is most improved when you use more difficult tests that tax your memory to a greater degree. For example, a free recall test where you have to retrieve the information works better than a multiple choice test where you just have to recognize the correct answer. Also, it's important to get feedback. It's important to know whether or not you got the right answer. There are flashcard programs out there designed to make testing yourself easier. One program that is free and popular is Anki, A-N-K-I. I have linked to it in the show notes. There are some caveats when it comes to testing. These caveats are minor, but I shall mention them anyway. Testing can produce interference effects whereby you remember the tested items better, but your ability to remember similar untested items decreases. Also, multiple choice tests can lead people to remember a wrong answer that they were exposed to in the answer set of the question. These effects are very small and heavily outweighed by the positive benefits of testing. The only other caveat I'll mention is you can overfit your learning to the test. If you use flashcards, you will learn to associate a prompt with a response, but you may be remembering a specific example instead of a general rule. For example, if you are learning grammar in a foreign language using flashcards, You may train yourself to apply some grammatical rule to a particular sentence, but be unable to apply that rule to unseen sentences. A solution to this is to make yourself come up with a new application each time you review the same card. Here's a tip from the technologist Jack Kinsella on how he uses this technique. Quote, When reviewing my deck of flashcards on cognitive biases slash logical fallacies slash rationality, I challenge myself to think of an example of that specific flaw in thinking that either I or someone else committed in recent memory. Failing this, I construct a fictional example. The point here is to use the knowledge in a manner parallel to its real-world usage rather than mindlessly press a button within my Anki application, end quote. Number four, cramming versus spacing. The typical college student does very little studying throughout the semester, but then studies a bunch right before the exams. This practice of cramming is not without its merits. Given the incentives students are under, it's actually a decent strategy, Cramming can get information into your memory long enough to regurgitate it on the test the next day. However, cramming is awful for long-term retention. You will forget what you cram. If all you care about is doing well on the test 
and the information isn't actually useful, and we could be honest here and say that much of what you are forced to learn isn't useful, then go forth and cram. However, if you actually care about remembering things, the far better strategy is to space out studying. Instead of studying four hours in one day, study the material for one hour once a week for four weeks. That will lead to much better long-term retention. The memory benefits of spacing have been known for centuries. I'll just mention one study as an illustration. In this study, surgical residents took four lessons on how to reattach tiny vessels. Each lesson included a lecture followed by some practice. Half of the residents completed all four lessons in a single day, which was the typical practice. The other half of the residents completed one lesson a week for four weeks. One month after their final lesson, all the residents were tested. The residents who had spaced out their learning outperformed the crammed learning group on all measures, they completed their surgeries faster, they used fewer hand movements, and they were more successful at reattaching the severed aortas of live rats. The beneficial effects of spacing are totally solid and uncontroversial. Spacing effects have been demonstrated across different domains of learning, across different species, including bumblebees and sea slugs, across different age groups, including infancy, childhood, adulthood, and the elderly, and spacing also appears to benefit people with memory impairments. So, space it out. If you want to remember the spacing effect, just think of Taylor Swift. The player's going to play, 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 and the hater's going to hate, 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 Baby, I'm going to space, 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 space. I space it out. I space it out. Number five, blocked practice versus interleaved practice. When you practice the same type of problem or the same expression of some skill over and over again, you are said to be engaged in blocked practice. For example... Say you want to practice playing four melodies on the piano, and you do so by playing each melody repeatedly for 20 minutes each. You practice the first melody for 20 minutes, then the second melody for 20 minutes, and so on. In this case, you are said to be engaged in blocked practice. You are practicing melodies in 20-minute blocks. If, during your practice, you mix in a variety of problem types or skill challenges, you are said to be engaged in interleaved practice. For example, if you want to practice playing four melodies on the piano, and you do so by playing the four melodies in a random sequence for 80 minutes, you are engaging in interleaved practice. In this case, you are not practicing the melodies in blocks, rather each melody is interspersed throughout your practice session. This distinction is important because interleaved practice is better. When people practice in an interleaved fashion, they learn more effectively. To illustrate this, I'll talk about two studies, a study of motor learning and a study of math learning. In our first study, collegiate baseball team players were given extra batting practice twice a week for six weeks. One group of players received pitches in a blocked fashion, 15 fastballs, then 15 curveballs, then 15 changeups. The other group received the same 45 pitches in a random sequence. On batting tests given after the extra practice sessions, the group that engaged in interleaved practice outperformed the group that engaged in blocked practice even when the test itself was blocked. In our second study, college students were taught how to calculate the volume of four geometric solids. They then completed two practice sessions separated by one week in which they solved problems 
that required them to calculate the volume for each geometric solid. One group practiced each problem type in blocks, whereas the other group practiced problems in an interleaved sequence. One week after the second practice session, all students were given the same test, and the interleaved group far outperformed the blocked group. The benefit of interleaved practice doesn't appear to be the result of spacing. The best theory going is that interleaved practice helps us more readily discriminate between different problems. When you are solving a variety of similar math problems, you get better at comparing the different problem types and you get better at using the right equation in the right situation. It's also possible that the increased difficulty of interleaved practice is beneficial for learning. One general theme in learning research is that increasing the difficulty is often beneficial. So perhaps interleaved practice is a sort of desirable difficulty. Interestingly, learners typically think that blocked practice is more effective. When study participants engage in both blocked and interleaved practice, they judge that they learned better with the blocked practice, even though they actually learned better with the interleaved practice. This is probably due to the fact that the interleaved practice is more difficult. Interleaved practice feels like more of a struggle, so students don't feel like they are mastering the task. There are a couple of caveats to keep in mind when deciding which type of practice to engage in. First, blocked practice is probably better when first learning some skill or problem type. You should have some basic competence before you start interleaving. Here's a strategy you can follow that comes from a very highly cited paper by psychologist John Dunlosky and collaborators. Quote, after a given kind of problem or topic has been introduced, practice should first focus on that particular problem. After the next kind of problem is introduced, that problem should first be practiced, but it should be followed by extra practice that involves interleaving the current type of problem with others introduced during previous sessions. As each new type of problem is introduced, practice should be interleaved with practice for problems from other sessions, end quote. Second caveat, expect practice performance to be worse when interleaving. Interleaved practice is harder. People make more mistakes when engaging in interleaved practice. However, they make fewer mistakes when tested in the future. So don't let worse performance during practice scare you away from interleaving. Third caveat, interleave problem solving takes longer. Solving 10 math problems of the same type takes less time than solving 10 math problems of various different types interleaved. Per unit time invested, interleaving is superior, but it's harder, so it takes longer. Final caveat, the benefits of interleaving show up most strongly in math learning. The body of research on interleaving is small, relative to testing and spacing, and there are some null effects, but it seems promising enough and not terribly expensive to implement. Remember the following motto, to best achieve, interleave. Number six, the teaching effect. There's plenty of literature establishing that teaching others helps the teacher themselves retain the material. We learn material better when we teach it to others. This phenomenon has been creatively named the teaching effect. I mentioned the benefit of spacing is referred to as the spacing effect, and it just so happens that the benefit of testing is referred to as the testing effect. Psychologists come up with boring names. In my experience, the teaching effect is in part driven by finding out what you don't understand. It can feel like I understand something, but when I am preparing to teach it, it becomes apparent that there are gaps in my knowledge, and to teach effectively, I go forth and fill those gaps. 
This probably isn't the whole explanation. There is research showing that actually teaching has benefits above and beyond merely preparing to teach. It's possible that teaching is itself a form of retrieval practice. It's a free recall test of sorts. So maybe some of the benefit comes from having to retrieve the material from memory as you are teaching it. Regardless, the teaching effect is well-established. So to be a good student, become the teacher. Number seven, elaboration. Elaboration refers to finding additional layers of meaning in whatever you are trying to understand. This can mean relating the material you're learning to things you already know, explaining how the material relates to your life, or coming up with metaphors or visual images. Here are some examples, which I am pulling from the book Made to Stick by Peter Brown and collaborators. Quote, To better grasp the principles of angular momentum in physics, visualize how a figure skater's rotation speeds up as her arms are drawn into her body. When you study the principles of heat transfer, you may understand conduction better if you imagine warming your hands around a hot cup of cocoa. For radiation, visualize how the sun pools in the den on a wintry day. For convection, think of the life-saving blast of AC as your uncle squires you slowly through his favorite back alley haunts of Atlanta. When you learned about the structure of an atom, your physics teacher may have used the analogy of the solar system with the sun as the nucleus and electrons spinning around like planets. The more that you can elaborate on how new learning relates to what you already know, the stronger your grasp of the new learning will be and the more connections you create to remember it later. End quote. Number eight, generation. Generation refers to trying to solve a problem before being shown how to find the solution. Learning is enhanced if we try to answer a question ourselves before the answer is given to us. This has apparently been put into practice at Washington State University in St. Louis, where physics students are expected to work on problems previous to the class in which they are taught how to solve them. The application of this technique is pretty straightforward. When learning something, try to see if you can figure out the answer to some question before looking it up yourself. Number nine, sleep. Sleep is very important for memory consolidation. Inadequate sleep is quite bad for learning. So if you want to remember what you learn, it would behoove you to get enough sleep. Also, memory consolidation may be influenced by whether you expect to need the knowledge in the future. For example, there are studies showing that sleep improves the retention of learned material, but only if participants expected to be tested on that material. This is interesting in its own right, but it may explain another finding. It appears that retention is superior when the material is learned shortly before sleeping. For example, studies have found that material learned at night is remembered better than material learned in the morning. It may be that if you study before bed, the expectancy of needing to recall the material in the future is stronger, so memories of what you study are preferentially consolidated. Or perhaps sleep stabilizes memory and if you study in the morning, you're exposing yourself to a whole day of memory deterioration before you get the stabilizing benefits of sleep. This is all on the speculative side, and I don't see time of day as an important consideration relative to other things, but all else equal, perhaps it's better to study before bed. It's also plausible that napping after learning enhances retention, all else equal. So catch some Z's to consolidate memories. All right, there you have it. An exhaustive review of how to learn better. In order to help you remember how to learn better, 
I wove mnemonic devices and dumb jokes throughout the episode, but I shall go one step further. Testing is one of the strongest memory techniques we have. So to help you remember the information in this segment, I am now going to give you a test. I'm going to ask five questions. I'll repeat each question twice. I will then give the answers to those questions. So just think of the answers in your head, or if you can, say the answers out loud. You might want to play the podcast at normal speed from here on out, or be willing to pause it. Here we go. Question one. What is Cowan's second law? Question one, what is Cowan's second law? Question two, what is the name of the free flashcard software that I mentioned? Question two, what is the name of the free flashcard software that I mentioned? Question three, name three learning techniques that are relatively ineffective. Question three, name three learning techniques that are relatively ineffective. Number four, what is elaboration? Question four, what is elaboration? Question five, what is generation? Question five, what is generation? All right, here are the answers. Question one, what is Cowan's second law? There is a literature on everything. Question two, what is the name of the free flashcard software that I mentioned? Anki, A-N-K-I, Anki. Question three, Name three learning techniques that are relatively ineffective, highlighting, rereading, and cramming. You could also have said something like block practice compared to interleaved practice or learning according to your learning style. Question four, what is elaboration? Elaboration refers to finding additional layers of meaning in whatever you are trying to understand. This can mean relating the material You are learning to things you already know, explaining how the material relates to your life, or coming up with metaphors or visual images. And question five, what is generation? Generation refers to trying to solve a problem before being shown how to find the solution. That concludes today's exam. Hopefully, encouraging you to retrieve this information will help you remember it. With that, let us head on over. To check this wreck. In this segment, I recommend some bit of media that you are perhaps unfamiliar with. In the previous segment, I mentioned The Great Courses. The Great Courses is a series of college level audio and video courses that you could find online. I've listened to a number of great courses through Audible, and this episode's wrecks are my favorite courses that I've listened to. You can find these courses by signing up for Audible, which is an audiobook subscription service. The Great Courses also offers video lectures, but those seem to be way more expensive. Before I get into these recs, I'll make it clear that I am not being paid to advertise for Audible or The Great Courses or anybody. All right, here are my three recs. Foundations of Economic Prosperity, taught by Daniel Dresner. Myths, Lies, and Half-Truths of Language Usage, taught by John McWhorter. And The Higgs Boson and Beyond, taught by Sean Carroll. If you want to learn interesting things, and you have an Audible account, and you have a sec, check this rec. That's it for this episode. The sources that I've referred to throughout the episode, including this week's rec, can be found in the show notes. This podcast is an effective altruist project. 
If you aren't familiar with effective altruism and you would like to learn more, I would recommend visiting effectivealtruism.org. Now, go forth and make history. Mm-hmm.